everyone, this is Rich Kitzman. I'm going to continue on with something I've been talking about. If you are enjoying these uh, teachings, I'd appreciate it if you could hit like and uh, subscribe to it. And also, if I would appreciate it if you would share it as well, just to get the word out there. Um, I've been talking about the heavenly places and how important it is to get to these places. Uh, today, I want to talk about three requirements, three, I think, three, yeah, um, of, of, that are necessary to get to the heavenly places. What are three things that need to be active in our lives that will assist us or help us tremendously to get to the heavenly places? The first one I want to list off is what I call desperation. Now, I want to clarify, uh, it's a desperation that takes one to the Lord. It's a, it's, a, it's a sense of desperation. It's where you, you know you don't have the answers. You probably tried it in the past. You tried things and they did not work. And so now you, you, you lean upon the Lord and you want the Lord to assist you. You want the Lord to help you. And what drives a person to that, to cry out to the Lord, because every other time you tried it, it didn't work. And that is, so you have to be desperate. You have to be desperate to, to cry out to God. Um, you have to be desperate to get his attention. This reminds me of the, the story in the New Testament about the blind man. He was sitting along the road and Jesus was passing by with a, cr a crowd of people. The blind man could hear the crowd, but he, of course, he couldn't see. He didn't know who was passing by that was causing such, such a turmoil. Then finally he asked somebody and the, and the guy said it was Jesus. Well, he knew, because this guy, I'm kind of speculating, but he's probably, he'd probably been to doctors, he'd, he'd talked to people, he, he may have even had people pray over him, and he was still blind. So he thought this person, he, he'd heard about Jesus passing by, he heard about Jesus and the miracles and the healings that he was performing, so he began to cry out, he began to yell. Now that's a sign of desperation. He had exhausted everything to get help, to get rid of his blindness, but nothing helped. So his last, you might say is his last resort. He yelled to Jesus. He wouldn't shut up. He kept yelling and yelling. Some people tried to get him to quiet down. He was so loud because Jesus had already passed by, but he's yelling so loud that he got Jesus' attention on the front of the crowd. And Jesus finally, he stopped. And, and uh, the guy, and, and they tried to tell Jesus, well, he's just sitting over there, don't be bothered by him. And Jesus stopped, because why? Because Jesus sensed the desperation in this guy. And they brought him forward, and Jesus says, what do you want? He says, I want to be able to see. See, he was desperate. That's an example of what I'm trying to get across of desperation. He knew of, new other, he knew of no other way to get help, so he turned to the Lord. And the Lord came, stood beside him and prayed over him, and he was healed. He got his eyesight back. That's the desperation I'm talking about. That's what needs to be in us if we want to get <clears throat> into the heavenly places. If we want to go into the throne room of God, we have to be a people who are desperate. We have to know that this is the only way that we're going to get help is to get is to the throne room of God because it's in the throne room where things get resolved. It's where you get it. You get answers to your questions that come from there. You get guidance from the Holy Spirit in this place. The second one is humility, and humility is a is a big one, just like desperation is. And humility is a person who's at a low state. Now, what I mean by that. Again, like desperation, this is a person who's tried things and they, they have not worked out in the past. And so they are, they've come to a place of lowness. They've come to a place of looking to somebody else for help, knowing from their own experience they haven't been able to pull things off. Now, a person who has experienced some success through their own charisma, many times are not humble. And they haven't learned humility. Humility comes through to a person because they have not been able to cause success to come their way by through themselves. So they start to look to somebody else. Now you can look to other people, but again, that's going to be very, very limited. 
So the real, the person that's, that is truly humble will look to the Lord and they will look to the Lord for their answers because of their humility. And the amazing thing about humility, when a person is humble, they don't have the answers and they don't want their own answers because it's easy for us as human beings to come up with our own solutions. But like I said, our solutions most of the time, if not always, do not perform and do not achieve the things that God wants for us. Now, we can experience some success within ourselves, but the, the success the Lord wants for us only comes through humility. Real success from God comes through humility because in real humility, you are looking to the Lord for your answers. You're looking to the Lord for your help. And because of, when you're in that state of humility, what does God pour on you? He pours on you grace. And grace is the operating power to cause you to overcome any obstacle that comes your way. God is putting his favor on the, those who are humble. He looks to them and he pours out solutions to them. He shows them the way to go because, he, because the Lord knows a person that's humble, is, they are looking just to him because they know there's no other way they're going to achieve the things they have in mind to do except for the Lord come and help them do that. And, and let me let me say this another way too. It what we have learned in our in the U.S. is if you want to achieve something, put your mind to it, you can do it. Or another saying I've heard before is pull up your bootstraps, you can do it. Just get on with it. That's not kingdom. I mean that's a good gesture to get on with it, and we do want to get on with it. But in the but in the process of trying to achieve something, we must. There must be humility, and, and, and God will, in your humility, God will meet your needs. There's nothing when a person is humble, there's nothing impossible for them. And the end result of a humble person, the end result of receiving help from the Lord is thanksgiving. A humble person immediately starts to give thanks to the Lord. The third one is hunger. Now, hunger is extremely important as well. Hunger is something that develops in us by some activities that we do and also because the Lord creates hunger in us. I just want to say to you, it's, it's very important that we be hungry. If we are hungry, if you're not hungry, ask the Lord to make you hungry. All you got to do is ask and it shall be given to you. If you ask the Lord for hunger, he'll begin to stir up a deep hunger within you. But you have to mean it. And if you mean it, you won't forget it. And if you ask him, this is, going to, this is something that's going to come up over and over because you're never satisfied in the true hunger that comes from God. Um, there's a scripture that says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they'll be filled. True hunger causes, the outworking of true hunger causes us to be filled with the presence of God. Hunger is a, is a means of getting into the throne room. Hunger is a means of getting into, into that presence that I've been talking about. So it's a prerequisite. All three of these are. Now, I want to give you a story about hunger. There is what I call natural hunger and then spiritual hunger. In natural hunger, it's like this. The day before Thanksgiving, when you're going to get together as a family and you're going to eat, you, start, you may start thinking about the food that's going to be set on the table. You may have a particular house you go to and you've been there before. Or maybe you're going to somebody else's house, but you always have your big Thanksgiving feast, the food, the turkey, the ham, whatever you have, sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes, uh, pies, and, and uh, so on. All this food you're thinking about and probably, and what I have found from my own experience, when you go to a Thanksgiving dinner, you get there, but it, it never, it's never quite ready when you get there. You gotta sit there and you gotta smell the fragrances of the food that's being cooked, the dressing and so on. And you're, you begin to, you begin, your mouth begins to water because you're thinking of the food that you're about to start shoving in your mouth. And you sit there and you can see them setting the food on the table so you know it's getting close. And you're, you're, you're hungry. You, and Many times in my, my past, I wouldn't even eat breakfast because I knew I was going to have this big meal and I could hardly wait and I wanted to be able to stuff myself as much as I could. So anyway, they get everything on the table and said, okay, let's come and eat. So everybody comes to the table and it's, it's for half an hour, there's hardly any talking because everybody's putting food in their mouth. 
And then, and so you, after you finish the meal, then somebody will come out and say, who wants dessert? And nobody wants dessert because you're so full, your stomach is bulging. All you want to do is sit down, lay down, watch TV and relax while your, your body starts to digest the food. But the thing about natural hunger is once you eat, you're not hungry anymore. Not for a while. And you don't want to eat anymore for a while. Now, if that's the way spiritual hunger is, once you read the Bible, once you pray, once you spend some time in worship, you shouldn't want to worship anymore. You shouldn't have a desire to do the things of God anymore for a while. But spiritual hunger is different. Now, you need to catch this. In spiritual hunger, as you begin to as you begin to pray, as you begin to worship, as you begin to read the word, you want to do more of it, especially worship. When you spend time in God's presence and you're encountering the throne room because you have a deep hunger for God, you get satisfied, but you never get to the point where you don't want more. Actually, as you as you press into the presence of God, you go into the throne room and you're spending time with God, you find that it's such an amazing experience. You're satisfied, but yet you want more. There's this deep stirring in you for more and more of being in the throne room of God. This is why David in Psalms 27, I think it is, he's, this is more towards the end of his life. And he said, one thing I ask the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to gaze upon his beauty and to seek him in his temple. See, David never got tired of going and gazing upon the beauty of the Lord. He never got tired of going and looking at, looking at the, uh, the presence of God. The more you do that, the more hungry you become and the more you are altered on the inside. Now I want to read, I want to read just a couple verses. This has to do with the Old Testament. It says, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy presence? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who, he who has not, not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. Then it goes on and says, This is Jacob, the generation of those that seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up your everlasting doors. This is the king of glory that's coming in. The verse, this chapter goes on. It's not real long. You can go back and read it. It was, it was, is um, Psalms 24, 1 through 10. I didn't read the whole thing. But the point I want to make here is, in the Old Testament, it says, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? This was written back then, meaning it, had, it was a physical thing of ascending to the place of the, of the sanctuary of God. But it goes beyond that. You find the Bible, when, it, when you read verses, it's talking about that time, but it's also talking about a future time as well. And just as this is. So this is talking about ascending the hill of the Lord. I want to look at it as, as it affects us today. This is talking again about going to the throne room of God. Notice there were certain requirements. And you have to live a sanctified life to go into the throne room of God. You just can't say to yourself, I'm going to go in the presence of God. Because one of the first things you run into when you want to go to the throne room of God is, what's my life like? Am I, in, am I in any sin? If you try to go to the throne room of God, you're in sin. The first thing you get confronted with is your sin. You need to confess it. You need to get rid of it so you can, so you can move on in your journey into the presence of God. God. You cannot go into the presence of God and be in sin. It's impossible. God is not a God who, our God is not a God who entertains sin. Jesus died for sin. And he died because of sin so we could have everlasting life, so we could experience the fullness of God in his presence. So his blood sanctifies, takes away the sin. So we, so we, in going to the throne room of God, or to the hill of the Lord in this case, we realize this was set up in the Old Testament, but it's, but it's a prophesying of a future time. And that's what I'm talking about, going to the throne room of God. Even in the Old Testament, it talked about going to the hill of the Lord. And for us, that means... As the heavens have been opened, when Jesus got baptized, we now can ascend the hill of the Lord and go into his presence because we've been invited and welcome to come in. Remember, you have to be hungry. You have to be hungry. 
you have to be humble and you have to be desperate. Desperate, humility, and hunger are three important qualities that you must have working in your life to go to this place I'm talking about, into the heavenly places. So these are, the, these are some of the prerequisites. Are they all of them? No. I'm just giving you three that I think are very important. Thank you very much.